Hello everyone and welcome to the first dry dock of February and that is dry dock episode 284. This week the questions are taken from guides 374 and 375 that's the Swedish coastal defense ship Oscar II and the submarine HMS X1 and then the Wednesday videos on designing the Yamato and the battle of the Komondorsky Islands with a guest question or two from the wet Friday video on ship types in the age of steam and incidentally if you want to listen to the dry docks as a podcast I've begun listing them in a podcast format on YouTube in well I've called them seasons but essentially year order so as of the time that you're hearing this they should all be up I think there are seven seasons including 2024 and I'll be adding the dry docks as they go up uh, to that the podcast playlist with maybe about a week or so's um, lag mainly because ultimately this is now my job and um, you know if you watch the dry dock even for a little bit um, it helps uh, and I whereas I don't know what happens with YouTube podcasts and if that works for those of you who've been asking for the dry docks as a podcast then fantastic um, if it doesn't, if you still can't just play it while you're driving or whatever, let me know and I'll look into an uh, alternate podcast platform for MP3s or something like that. Scott Mason asks, now that you've seen a number of different maritime museums from different countries, which ones would you recommend that people go to visit? Well, essentially, thus far, I would say any of the museums that I visited, so you can look at um, the tour lists when I've been going to various places overseas and the videos that I've produced from them although bear in mind obviously not all the US or Australian uh, museums that I visited have actually gotten videos made so far and there's even one or two from Canada that I still need to work on once I can recover some corrupted video footage so yeah uh, thus far I would say 95 to 97% of all the museums that I've visited have been absolutely excellent, really friendly staff, really good ex exhibits, you know, and therefore definitely well worth um, yourselves going to see them. And even the sort of two, three percent where I've had a negative experience or two, it hasn't been the fault of the museum itself as a whole, as in like there's nothing wrong with the, the exhibits there. And the majority of the staff are still absolutely perfectly fine. So you know, never let one or two bad apples spoil the whole bunch. They're still worth going to see. Now, that doesn't mean that museums I haven't visited aren't worth going to. It's just that I haven't been to them, therefore I can't report back 100%. But a lot of that is just down to time and money. Um, you know, if if I had the time to prepare two months worth of content ahead of time and then, you know, swan off to the United States and visit all the extremely long list of museum ships and so forth that are on my list to visit, that would be fantastic. But that, unfortunately, that's not the way life works. Um, but with all of that said, I would specifically at, at this point, so what's this, uh, beginning of February 2024, I would recommend that people go visit the museums that perhaps are a little bit harder up for cash for whatever reason, either because there's major works ongoing that they need to undertake to save the ship um, and to keep it maintained. So, you know, USS Kidd, USS New Jersey, both of which are heading for dry dock later this year, um, all things going well. Um, and you know, places that, yeah, and I know it might seem a little bit like, oh, maybe I don't like the weather there, but, um, you know, places like USS Salem over in Quincy or Battleship Cove, USS Massachusetts um, for the Northeast Coast, they will absolutely appreciate a visit. So I would essentially say, you know, look for the museum ships that are either in areas where perhaps the weather is a little less clement and therefore people might not normally want to go there, um, or places where the ship itself is small um, or the ships are small so you know 
USS New Jersey, of course, is on one side of the Delaware, but you know, don't forget Bakuna and Olympia are on the other side. Um, the Sullivans at uh, and Little Rock, etc., all over up at Buffalo. You know, these are some of the US museums. But over in the UK, following that kind of theme, obviously check times, make sure they're open ahead of time. But if you happen to be in Scotland, please go and visit HMS Unicorn. And I suppose, you know, in the UK and some places in Europe, like say the Netherlands or Belgium, you can have a choice of visiting lots of different museum ships. Whereas in bigger places like Australia, Canada, the US, it's going to be admittedly somewhat limited by where are you actually going to be? And you know what museum ships are in reach of you there, because to be perfectly honest, if if you're in the UK, pretty much almost wherever you're staying, there'll be about half the country's museum ships within relatively easy reach of you. Whereas in some of those bigger countries, you pretty much have only one or two choices from a specific geographic point. Brendan Boersdorf asks, I believe in a previous dry dock, someone talked about hybrid propulsion systems of triple expansion engines and steam turbines. Yeah, they did. But I was curious about how effective would World War I German diesel and steam turbine hybrid systems have been, given that it was going to be used in one of the Kaiser class and apparently also in one of the Bayern class battleships. So the issues that we've gone over before with diesel engines, you know, relatively low power output per surface area in World War One and World War Two aren't so applicable with the setup that the Germans were planning to use on Prince Regent Liedbold, which was the Kaiser class in question that you mentioned, because it was never planned for that diesel engine to, or deep diesel engine power plant as a whole, to run her at high speed on its own. That's why the turbines were there, although the diesel would have been running as well to give a little bit extra oomph. And therefore, you've kind of circumnavigated that problem. The only remaining issue would have been that, of course, the diesel engine is still going to be a little bit heavier and potentially take up a little bit more space than the equivalent power output of steam turbine. So your machinery plant as a whole will be a little bit heavier, maybe a little bit larger if you um, are trying to go for equivalent power. And of course that detracts from other things you can do with the ship, but it seems with, at least with Prince Regent Luitpold, that they were going for taking up a similar amount of space and maybe accepting just a fraction of, of a weight penalty because it was essentially going to be a, a cruising and support engine only. Now, in overall terms, even with the World War One diesel, and bear in mind World War One ship diesels weren't as good as the World War Two ship diesels were going to be, there was still an, an advantage to it, at least on paper, because the anticipated efficient power efficiency of a standard Kaiser class, so three turbines and three thousand six hundred metric tons of coal, is about two point two mi nautical miles per ton. Now, that gives you a range at cruising speed, projected to be 12 knots, of just under 8,000 nautical miles, in fact, 7,900. With Prince Regent Leedwold having a reduced bunker capacity for coal to make room for the diesel fuel oil, etc., that means she's only got a cruising range on coal of just a hair over 7,000 nautical miles. But... The diesel, with its 400 tons of fuel, is supposed to actually be good for another 2,000 nautical miles at 12 knots, which would give her a total range of around 9,000 nautical miles at 12 knots, which is about 1,100 nautical miles better than her pure turbine trip and sister ships. There are the only disadvantages at that point are, of course, the aforementioned weight and space issues and also the fact that if she had been fitted with this engine and she was able to do that, the efficiency is only realised if she actually cruises that 2,000 nautical miles at 12 knots with the diesel engine and then switches over to coal or with the turbines or maybe you know does some kind of combination thereof. But if she then needs to move at very high speed 
So perhaps she's only, I don't know, going a few hundred miles out into the North Sea and then charging around for a day. Then the f overall fuel efficiency will drop. And in case you're wondering, the projected fuel efficiency of a diesel engine was five nautical miles per tonne of fuel burnt. And of course, one of the other advantages she would have had is that if she had gone charging around at full speed during the day, you know, I don't know, shooting at and then running away from various British warships, then come nightfall, once her coal-driven engines, well, boilers more realistically, uh, start to clog up with ash and clinker from the horrendous quality German coal that they're using, the diesel engine's going to motor on just fine, which would mean that she would either be able to reduce the overdrive, if you like, on her coal-fired plant, which would perhaps offset and delay the build-up of clinker and ash, or because she's able to consistently run that central shaft, she would maybe be able to more readily shut down one of the other shafts and get cleaning and clearing programs done on that sooner, and then switch over to clear out the other one. So she may not actually, if she had had that installation, been able to sustain her top speed with a lot of frantic work in the engines for considerably longer. Of course, she didn't actually receive it, and she only went out with uh, two turbine shafts, but such is life. Daniel Regnard asks... I was watching a video about how after World War II at the Admiral Shears wreck was in fact buried as the harbour that she was in filled, was filled in. This has me wondering, do you think it's possible to ever go and dig up what's left of her if anything would be left? Now it's rather interesting you should say that because recently I was reading um, a, a paper from the 15th International Conference on Archaeological Prospection which is written by a combination of scholars from the Institute of Geosciences at Kiel University and the Institute of Pre and, Pre and, Pre and Proto-Historic Archaeology at Kiel University, um, called Deal with Steel, Investigating the Wreck of the Heavy Cruiser Admiral Scheer, where they actually went out and did scans to figure out exactly what was left. Um, you can find it relatively easily if you Google any number of the combinations of those previous details I just mentioned. Now, you have to bear in mind that before she was buried, the bow and stern were removed, so only the midship section, although a considerable portion of it, was actually buried. And, of course, it's going to be lying mostly below the water table in amongst a bunch of fairly coarse fill, at least in engineering terms. So there's going to be a lot of water intrusion, a lot of rust, and bearing in mind they're used to using a lot of rubble, potentially also leached chemicals from concrete rubble and so forth that would have further accelerated the rusting of the vessel. Now, from what I'm interpreting from their results, and they do discuss it in the paper as well, it seems that the bulk of the wreck is still there, although the resolution they were able to generate isn't fine enough to tell which precise parts of the ship are still there, i.e., you know, if you imagine just trimming a bit off the back and front of the wreck as you see in this picture... Does it pretty much look like that, just under three, four metres of rubble uh, to get to the top of the wreck? Or has it all been compacted flat and turned into something of a sad pancake of rust? And how much of the material is being held in place just by the fact it's in the middle of a bunch of infill? And how much of it is that would actually be self-supporting, i.e. if you did dig it up, would it just collapse on itself or would it still be freestanding? We don't know. Although given the description of the conditions would match my definition of unfavourable <laughs> environments for the survival of steel, I wouldn't necessarily hold my breath. Although given that the bulk of the wreck is under a car park, I suppose with enough money there's no massive physical obstacle to going and finding out what might be left. I mean... It is right next to the current German Navy's, one of, well, one of the current German Navy's ports, and there is a rather large building sitting on the uh, more southern end of the wreck. But you, yeah, in theory, if you, the Bundesmarine, I think is what it's called these days, um, if they were happy to give you permission and you had a JCB, you could probably go down and at least find some bit of it. Mr. Dauntless asks... HMS X1 is supposed to be able to use its rangefinder to pre-aim the main armament surface and immediately open fire. 
However, the turrets seem to be open-topped and not in a separate pressure hull akin to Sir Koof's, so how would X-1 have been able to use its main armament in its intended role if there are no crew to operate them? Would they have had to get out of the conning tower and run over to them as quickly as possible with water still running off the ship's hull? Why didn't they make the turrets pressurised? So they had thought of this, and no, you wouldn't have had to go scrambling out of the conning tower. The way they solved this issue was you would have a gun trunk. So, you know, obviously the magazines need to feed ammunition up, and they thought, well, why not put some ladders there as well with watertight hatches? So the idea was that once the guns were ready and pre-aimed and everything was good and the ship was, re well, sub, was ready to surface then sub comes up and as soon as enough water has cleared from the gun mountings for people to be able to actually utilize the guns which will be a little bit sooner than the ship is actually fully on the surface as you can see in kind of this position in cruising because of the height of the gun mounts above the well if you like the regular water line when the sub is surfaced the gun crews, who then will have been waiting on the ladders immediately below the gun platforms, will open the hatch, or hatches, and pile out, and there they are. They're on the gun mountings. The power hoists will already have the shell and charge ready to go, ready to pop up. So, essentially, the sub pops up, and within a few seconds of the turrets clearing, or gun mounts, clearing the water then the crew can be there loading the guns and they can be ready to open fire. So whilst it's not a you know surface up to the level of the deck and open fire remotely with the guns, it's also a far cry from people having to pile up through the conning tower, run along, jump into the gun mountings, and then start worrying about loading, tr uh, aiming, training, etc., etc. Literally all you've got to do is open a hatch, you know, climb out of the hatch, pick up the relevant piece of ammunition and slot it in. So from hatch opening to gun being ready to fire would be less than 15 seconds. Reaver asks, just how much does a steel hull submarine crush as it dives? I appreciate the bits all get a bit squished by the water, but I would not have assumed that the metal could shrink overly drastically. But then we hear about internal components getting crushed. And it leaves me wondering. Uh, engineering materials, Drac can go to his happy place. So, the answer is, yes, uh, steel hull submarines will crush somewhat as they dive, but the degree to which that occurs and how it occurs varies quite considerably. Uh, the two most obvious things that will cause these variations will be how deep you're diving, you know, how much pressure is actually pressing down on the sub, and also how thick the steel is. Beyond that, you've also got the quality of the steel, you know, how strong it is per inch thickness or whatever other unit you want to measure it with, how well supported the hull is by the internal structure does also make something of a difference, but you don't want to make the hull too rigid, otherwise you will have problems when something shears. Now, in terms of the actual steel compression, you have what's called elastic and plastic deformation in most materials. Theoretically, any material has features of both, but with some materials, you know, the margin where one happens and not the other can be very, very minimal. So, for example, glass, most commonly known for its plastic deformation, not its elastic deformation, whereas an elastic band, well, clues in the name. So, essentially, elastic deformation in engineering terms is when you deform a material, in this case, you're compressing down a steel pressure hull and it changes its shape in some way shape or form it bends it crushes in whatever but when you take that force away submarine surfaces for example the material returns to near enough its original state technically speaking it should return to exactly its original state but you know that's not technically exactly what happens most of the time and then you have plastic deformation and plastic deformation is a permanent deformation. That is what you do not want to happen, uh, because that means that something's bent, buckled, etc. relative to everything else. Now, when it comes to compressing things like steel at a very high 
amount of pressure and therefore a lot of force, you actually do get a very slight bit of plastic deformation accompanying the elastic deformation, which is why you also you will get things like metal fatigue in aircraft, because if it was completely elastic deformation, it would just keep going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But with a little bit of plastic deformation every time it expands and contracts, whether that's an aircraft, a submarine hull, or any other metal that's regularly undergoing stress, eventually failure will build up. But nonetheless, assuming that your submarine is well designed and you're sticking within its rated depths, you should undergo mostly elastic deformation and the amount that the hull compresses is also finally proportional to the overall size of the hull. Now, if you're using the same material, theoretically a submarine that's say a thousand tons and of the relevant size should deform by the same percentage as a submarine that's got a pressure hull double the size, um, assuming that all the other equations, you know, you've used the same material in and the appropriate thicknesses and so on and so forth and balanced out all the other things. But that's proportional, that's percentage. So if your hull is double the width, you're going to notice, say, a 2% reduction in overall size, considerably more than if the hull is half the width, because you know that size is considerably greater. So for example, if you had a string and you stretched it between the sides of, say, a 20-foot wide hull, that's undergoing a 2% deformation. That means your living space just got narrower by almost five inches. You'll probably notice that things will get pushed around. Whereas in theory, again, all other things being equal and balanced out in a 10 foot pressure hull, it's going to be just under 2.5 inches, which is still considerable, but you may not notice it quite as badly. Of course, submarines leave space for exactly this kind of thing to happen either just you know, ship basic space between components and the hull or flexible mountings and so on and so forth. But those are to within the tolerances expected by the compression of the hull during a typical dive. If you end up going down to test depth or even you approach crush depth and you survive, the hull will compress considerably more and then things will start to get squashed and crushed because the hull will be compressing more than they were thinking it was going to when they installed all the internal components. Michael Kovacic asks, how long does it take for a question to be answered in the dry dock right now? Well, obviously I can't answer every single question that's put in the Q&A post for every single video, otherwise we'd be here till the end of time. Um, but in terms of when do I get to cover a particular video in the dry dock, well, as you may know, after falling behind because I was covering one week's worth of videos per dry dock, but obviously the Patreon dry dock at the end of each month was knocking me back by one week every month. Um, we're now in a position where, as you've guessed from the intro, we've been doing two weeks worth of videos per week of dry dock. So we've been doing six weeks every four, roughly speaking, with the Patreon dry docks obviously taking up one slot. And that means that this video, for example, is covering videos from the end of September. By the time we finish February, we will have completed up to the end of October. And so at that, at this point in time, as of this video going out, you're looking at what, four months delay. And I'm aiming to shorten that. So by the time, Basically, what I'm going to keep doing is keep going with the two weeks worth of videos answered in every dry dock until we get to about a two month lag. And then when we hit the two month lag, then I'll go to doing uh, two weeks of video in one dry dock, then a week, a week, the Patreon dry dock and so on and so forth, essentially keeping it at about a two month lag time. And the reason for that is that it means that if I am in a position where I need to start preparing videos in advance for an overseas trip, then that then obviously there will be, let's say I'm preparing a month in advance, there will be 
a month's worth of videos to take questions for the next month's dry dock for, ready for me to take rather than having to essentially fill in during the month as questions come in as videos are released. So yeah, at the moment about four months, but ideally it'll get down to about two months. Yellow Pete asks, how did the lookouts in Titanic get up to the crow's nests? Was it a lift or ladder? And did they have people climb up Yamato similarly, or was there a lift there? No lifts in either, I'm afraid. Um, just good, solid ladder work. Now, luckily, unlike some earlier ships, that didn't mean you were going to be exposed to the elements your entire way up. On Titanic, you can see the crow's nest spotting position, whatever you want to call it. It's the little white thing on the foremast there. And to get to that, the lower part of the foremast is actually a hollow metal tube and there's a ladder mounted inside so you would enter via a hatch at either on deck or below the main deck and you would just climb up and then once you got to the appropriate position there would be an opening where you could step out onto your spotting position. Aboard Yamato it's a slightly different proposition as you can see here from this uh, cross-section dash cutaway you don't have to sit in a tiny open top dustbin type thing, although it's a little bit bigger than a dustbin. There's enough space for several people on Titanic's uh, spotting position. But as you can see on Yamato, you would go up a series of ladders inside what's technically the foremast, but is also the forward superstructure. And you'd go up past the bridge and so on and so forth until you reached the upper levels. And you can see there, on when the sort of main superstructure itself runs out, you've got a fabric or very thin sheet metal covered viewing platform at which you would go up a ladder and then you'd just be out there. And then you've got one of the rangefinder setups and a little space above that. And those most likely you would have to access using ladders, um, but you're essentially remaining inside pretty much all the time. Referencing the Yamato video, Chipper Corgi asks, it seems like the aft deck extends out past the hull on almost all the Yamato designs. I'd be curious to know why it, almost every version of the Yamato class has this feature when no other battleship class did. This is due to a rather unique feature of the Yamato class. You can just about see it here on about a third of the way along the bottom of this picture. And that is that the Yamatos obviously have big guns forward, a rather large turret aft, and then amidships, apart from the superstructure and the funnel, is heavily populated by the secondary battery and the anti-aircraft battery. Obviously, this is Yamato in a very early state, so you can see she has the triple six-inch turret there on the port side, as well as the super-firing triple six aft, and then anti-aircraft guns above that, and later on, obviously, that port side and the corresponding starboard side triple six would be removed and even more dual purpose anti-aircraft guns would be installed along her deck. Now this meant that she couldn't have an amidships aircraft handling facility like say the British did with King George V and so they went with an aircraft handling facility aft pretty much like American practice on their fast battleships. And again, in this picture, you can actually just about see the rails for the aircraft handling system. Uh, again, about a third to halfway along the bottom there, just sort of poking out past the shed they've built on it. And then on the far right, running roughly in line with what to us is the starboard most 18.1 inch gun barrel. And that in turn meant you have another problem because you okay you're handling your aircraft at the back and they've got their hangar immediately underneath you've got your main guns your secondary guns your anti-aircraft guns where are your ship's boats <laughs> and uh, this being the problem they decided they were going to have a boat hangar inside as well but of course if you're going to have a boat hangar you need a way to get the boats out and that's what those little sort of if you're looking from top down fin-like protrusions for all, uh, the Yamato's aft actually are. So you've got a extended bit of deck above, which helps with the aircraft handling facilities, which is also providing shelter and runners for the boat hangar underneath. And that little void space that you can see, again, where I directed you initially, about a third of the way along from the left 
on the bottom of this photo, that's actually one of the entrances to the boat hangar. So the ship's boats would be stored below and then they could be pull, pulled out uh, on rails. People could get in them and then they could go off, which was actually a fairly clever solution given that they had the size of ship to accommodate these kinds of things. Cause of Death asks, I recently saw a carrier completely covered. It looked like it had been wrapped in white in Norfolk, Virginia. Never seen anything like that. What repair or work would require that? Did it perhaps look like an expanded version of this? Um, this is CBN 72 in San Diego. Uh, don't worry, everyone. This <laughs> There's no OPSEC being compromised by this picture. This picture is um, about a year old at this stage. But the main thing you can see is this long parade of white fabric, or well, it's actually tarp, a plastic tarp, being strung around a good portion of the ship's flight deck. Now, over in the UK, when you see the Queen Elizabeths in Portsmouth, sometimes they also look similar, um, sort of gazebos and so forth appearing all over the flight deck. And essentially, it's probably a combination of storage for materials, tools, equipment, and even extraneous personnel for the maintenance of the ship. And when it comes to this kind of, sort of border edging stuff, I suspect, although obviously this is modern era, so I can't necessarily 100% say for certain, but I suspect that this is more of a partial conceal what is being done specifically from the general public, but I'd also suspect as a form of safety rail um, to stop the civilian contractors from accidentally wandering over the side of the ship, <laughs> which, believe it or not, happens more often than you might think when you have people unfamiliar with a ship boarding a ship that doesn't have substantial safety rails. And of course, you can't really have a full run you know, wire fence safety rail going around the flight deck of an aircraft carrier for obvious reasons of aircraft need to actually use it. But, you know, it's a modern, your, your question is obviously about a modern ship and I'm showing you a modern ship. So don't worry, I'm not necessarily violating the rule of the channel about post 1950 stuff. This is just an example, because if you go back to looking at ships in mothballs in or ships that are under significant amounts of repair in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, etc., you see pretty much the same thing, just not necessarily perhaps so much blinding white plastic might be canvas or something like that instead plus of course um, the non-aircraft carrier types would also just have railings but if you happen to work in the u.s navy at the moment or you did until recently and you know quite why you might want to mummify an aircraft carrier in extensive amounts of white tarp other than to make the local lowe's manager very very happy and it's not anything particularly secret then maybe you could let us all know Michael Kovacic asks, what was McMorris's plan towards the end of the Battle of the Komondorsky Islands? If the Japanese had gone ahead with finishing off Salt Lake City, would he have committed his entire force, including the Richmond, to a last stand in defense of Salt Lake City? Or would he have had to have been ordered to abandon the heavy cruiser? Well, given that when Salt Lake City was temporarily stopped, he sent destroyers to try and launch torpedo attacks at the Japanese ships, which the destroyers, to be fair, did get fairly pummeled for, and only some, some torpedoes were loosed. If Salt Lake City had then been further crippled and was now completely dead in the water and was being shot to pieces by the Japanese, I suspect, given how many times she'd pulled herself back from the brink up to that point, he probably would have sent in the destroyers that still had torpedoes to try and launch another torpedo spoiling attack, whilst obviously continuing to try and make smoke, which is historically what they did to cover Salt Lake City the first time she went completely dead in the water. But if Salt Lake City has now, you know, hit on fire, sinking, etc., etc., I suspect that McMorris probably would have taken Richmond and any surviving destroyers, because a number of them may have been damaged or crippled or even sunk by the last-ditch counterattack, and taken what was left of his force and hightailed it, because... Richmond was capable of opening a gap on the Japanese cruisers, and obviously the destroyers could keep up with her, at which point, if your last-ditch attempt to save Salt Lake City has failed, and 
you've really got nothing else left in the tank other than maybe trying to charge forward with Richmond, which is pretty much tantamount to suicide, then the only real option at that point would be to try and save what you could, having otherwise done your utmost within reason to save Salt Lake City. And, you know, there's a, a chance that once Salt Lake City has been destroyed, if the Japanese choose not to pursue you, you can always come back and try and pick up survivors, whereas if you sacrifice your relatively tin-plated Omaha trying to stop the inevitable, then no one's going to be around to pick up your survivors. D. Oliver Gutierrez asks, what would the British destroyers be that are equivalent to the American Allen M. Sumner and gearing classes? It sort of depends on exactly what you mean by equivalent. If you mean by what were the British building and bringing into service at around the same time as the Americans were bringing the Sumners and the Gearings into service, then you'd be looking primarily at the various variations on the C-class destroyers, the last of the wartime emergency flotilla program. But if you're looking at sort of more design-wise, size-wise, and to a certain extent, at least by order date time-wise, um, i.e. the next generation of fleet destroyers, where it's obviously the Sumners and the Gearings follow on from the Fletchers, with the Gearings being expanded versions of the Sumners, essentially. And then you'd be looking for, you know, what is the follow-on to the Tribals, uh, J, Ks, Ls, Ms, and Ns, well, that would be the battle class, which you can see an example of here, and subsequently the daring class. So the battle class kind of fit in terms of the they're the successor full fleet destroyer to the previous fleet destroyer. They're ordered around the same time as the Sumners and Gearings and built around the same time. They just take a bit longer to enter service. And then the Darings, you know, the Darings are sort of the gearing as the gearing is to the sumner the daring is to the battle class but they are it's, although they're ordered in wartime they they only really they only see service in the post war period whereas the gearing's built fast enough that some of them do see world war ii service the reason i'm excluding the weapon class is because the weapon class are in some ways kind of an intermediate step between the wartime emergency flotillas and the return to the full fleet destroyer in that they're somewhat smaller vessels which are designed to allow a modicum of modern full fleet destroyer capability but using smaller hulls and yards that can work with those as opposed to the full fleet site type. Alan Williams asks, would you classify the US Navy's PCs, i.e. subchasers, as a corvette or a large gunboat in World War II? I think it depends on the class. The smaller ones, so the hundred, roughly 100 tonners that are wooden hulls and the 450 tonner steel hull subchasers, uh, one of which you can see in this picture. Personally, uh, the first ones are definitely too small to be a Corvette. I mean, they're not even a particularly large gunboat. They're just a gunboat that happens to hunt subs. These ones that you can see here... I'd still have to err on the side of large gunboat, to be perfectly honest. But when you get to the PC-842 class, now they're 850 tons, so they're almost twice the size of, at least displacement-wise, of these ones. Then at that point, I think you are getting into the realm of a Corvette-type vessel. So, you know, compare them to a flower class. I mean, the flower class comes off looking a little bit better because it's ever so slightly faster and ever so slightly better armed at least in the anti-submarine department but they are still you know within shouting distance of each other so yeah some are large gunboats but the larger sub chasers i think you know could easily merit the classification of a small corvette randy topeka asks prior to the advent of gunpowder based weapons did siege weapons such as catapults and ballista see widespread use on ships and if so, how effective were they? Yes, various weapons, particularly ballista in ancient times, did find their way onto ships. Not all ships. You did have to have a reasonable-sized vessel, after all, to, to utilise them. And 
their effectiveness and purpose varied quite considerably over time. Uh, because with the best will in the world, a ballista bolt, even if it does poke a hole in the side of your ship, is not going to be poking a particularly large hole in the side of your ship. And if you're using torsion or gravity catapults, mangonels, that kind of stuff, onagers, um, I mean, yes, in theory, a rock thrown at with sufficient force and with a sufficient ballistic arc might smash a big enough hole in a lightly built galley or something to cause you major problems. But the rate of fire and the statistical likelihood of actually hitting the target is so ridiculously small that, you know, that effect is not really worth considering. Instead, what you would generally use these more ancient weapons for would be anti-personnel use. So ballistas obviously can target people on deck or potentially, even, I suppose, even rowers um, through the relatively light sides of the hull. Um, but probably more precisely taking out you know, marines and maybe the steersmen, that kind of stuff. Um, you can also obviously load up ballista with essentially the catapult version of grape shot instead of just a big long bolt if you want and the catapults the, sort of the true catapults if you imagine them that way um, i.e the big swingy arm types those would normally launch some kind of incendiary or something like that because then you're not relying on smashing a hole in something you're just relying on setting a thing on fire uh, or some other agent you know uh, uh, we know that snakes in pots, for example, or Greek fire in pots was uh, occasionally used, depending on the engagement you look at in ancient times. When you get to the medieval era, by this point, ships are a little bit more durable than all but the largest ancient warships, um, mostly just a function of being higher sided and operating in northern European waters as much as in the Mediterranean. And they're not really using catapults and such as much, in part because actually quite a lot of medieval ships are either considerably smaller than the biggest ancient warships and or um, they are merchant vessels that have just been subordinated into military service, so they don't really have any kind of position suitable for the mounting of siege weaponry. But larger-scale siege weaponry, both in ancient times and particularly medieval times, was known to be mounted on ships occasionally, um, trebuchets, for example, on medieval period ships, but they weren't really used for going after your opponent, as in a ship-to-ship -ship action, they were usually mounted on ships as a specific measure to allow ships to essentially become floating siege platforms for attacking coastal cities, castles, those kinds of fortifications. And in that role, they had mixed success. Brad Bargmeyer asks, Captain Cook's journeys took him all the way from Cook Inlet in Puget Sound, Washington, near Bremerton Naval Base, to Australia. How the heck was it even possible for them to do that in the Age of Sail? More specifically, were there specific advances in navigation and or logistics that made it possible in that era? So Cook benefited from a number of rather radical confluences of things. Logistically, the ability to store food, or at least some foods that would last for a particularly long time on voyages had been around for quite a while, uh, but Cook took advantage or was allowed to take advantage of the fact that him, uh, one of his voyages was one of the very first which was comparing and contrasting scurvy remedies, which along with his own ideas on discipline and what the crew should and shouldn't eat, actually helped quite significantly. He didn't lose anyone to scurvy. In the era immediately before Cook's expeditions, lots of people went down with scurvy. You know, the ability to transport food and sail those distances was there, but you look at, say, Anson's voyages, which went as far, if not further, than Cook's in terms of miles sailed per voyage, but he lost vast numbers of men to scurvy, whereas, as I said, Cook didn't. This, by the way, is the replica of the Endeavour in Sydney Harbour, uh, in the rather excellent Sydney Maritime Museum. 
Now, that, of course, meant that Cook's not going to be losing men, as we just said. But how does he actually get to his destination? Well, Cook was a fairly well-trained and very skilled navigator and survey man, thanks in part to his service in the Royal Navy, which instructed him in the ways of navigation, as was only fitting for um, any significantly ranked officer, be they non-commissioned or commissioned, but also it allowed him to develop the talent because when it turned out in the Seven Years' War that Cook was actually really good at that particular aspect of seamanship, the Royal Navy then said, you're right, okay, well, guess what? You're the point man in our attack on what was then the French-held portions of what would become Canada. And he went on to develop those skills further during his naval service. And then, to cap it all off, as was discussed in the video that I did on the calculation of longitude and where you can all go and laugh at me for my somewhat repeated conflation of George Harrison and John Harrison, one of course being the Beatle and the other of course being the actual you know, clockmaker who is the key element of that whole story. Uh, but anyway, um, his invention and then the proliferation of reliable timepieces to allow the calculation of longitude went with the calculations of latitude, which they were already able to do, to enable the calculation of a reasonably accurate idea of where the ship actually was in the world. And that meant that you could not only take more direct courses, but you could also steer clear of dangers in anticipation of running into them instead of just taking a wild guess as to where you might actually be. And so when it comes to Cook's journeys, it's this, you know, this wonderful confluence of the ability to actually accurately navigate combined with a captain who knows general navigation and surveying really well, plus the fact he's got the anti-scurvy remedies aboard for almost the first time in a systematic scientific way, plus he's a fairly strict disciplinarian and he's keeping the ship clean anyway and on top of that the Endeavour is a really solidly built ship that can stand up to conditions that a number of other ships her size probably may not survive and certainly not survive intact and all of that came together to allow him to undertake some rather epic voyages of discovery although I rather suspect the uh, Aboriginal inhabitants of Australia when they saw him show up and say, I have discovered this portion of Australia, which is kind of like, nah, mate, you may have discovered it for yourself, but you know, we already knew it was here because, you know, we are here. And <laughs> we didn't just look down when uh, when you showed up and go, ooh, land. Didn't know that was there before. But I, I digress. I always do find it a, a little bit amusing, you know, whether it be Australia, North America, South America, where a lot of the time it's still categorized as discovered. It's like, no, whoever it was, you know, Vespucci, Columbus, Cook, etc., discovered this land from the perspective of the of the European perspective, which is all well and good, because obviously that's when knowledge of these lands entered into the general lexicon. But there were normally humans already there, and they weren't existing in some kind of poorly rendered world that only snapped into full resolution <laughs> when a sailing ship hove into view. If the gods had wanted us to be happy, they would have given us a delicious honey-based alcoholic beverage. Oh, look, mead. And yes, that is the full title of their username. Or as I like to call them, Mead Boy asks, During the classic Age of Sail, what were the immediate preparations for combat? Let's say you're on a frigate searching for a privateer and you expect to be a few days sail south of your position. With the winds filling your sails on your southern course, uh, a fog limits visibility. The fog lifts and you spot your target about a nautical mile out or so, sails furled, conducting minor repairs. As you get closer, it becomes clear that the ship is at the privateer you're searching for. The captain gives the order to prepare for combat. What activities take place aboard the ship between this order until the ca cannons unleash the final argument of His Majesty the King? Well, um, distance you'd hope would be a little bit more than that, because even for a cannon-armed ship, a nautical mile is uncomfortably close range but nonetheless taking a general principle a ship that was expecting to find combat would have already taken certain steps so you know the cannon for example would be limbered up so they'd be there everyone would have checked they're properly seated on their carriages there'd be supplies of shot on the gun deck 
the cannons obviously the carriages would all be roped into the onto the various bolt mountings etc on the hull um and pretty much almost ready to go the they would have made sure that the powder for example would be uh, in charge bags there'd be a ready supply of charge bags in the magazine rather than all being stored in the barrels and so forth so that would have been the kind of the longer preparation so in the first part of your question if you're expecting to find your target a few days sail south of your position and that's the kind of stuff you'd be doing then um, you may choose to put some additional rigging up that's something some captains would do in terms of the closer in preparing for battle you know when beat to quarters is sounded um etc then a number of other things would happen so you would go to battle sail which i've explained before um and that is essentially the furling of the main sails the lower sails so that they don't get in the way and so that the guy at the back with a wheel can actually see where the heck he's going the guns of course will be prepared and run out so you would have your guns loaded and then the gun ports will be opened the guns will be run out and the men would be standing by ready to fire at the order being given you would also have the order to clear the decks um, and that meant that anything extraneous that's on the deck which obviously might then be turned into a tripping hazard or a set of splinters would also be taken away so officers furniture in their cabins would be stored down below if possible uh, the boats would be put over the side usually and towed behind if the officers furniture and other extraneous bits and pieces couldn't be taken below quickly enough they'd be slung in the boats and then towed behind you'd also put the galley fires out uh, if they were going at that time some ships would put sand on the decks for extra grip once uh, all the blood starts being spilt in it etc obviously that depends on if your captain decides that's a good idea dear and if you have sand <laughs> on board which is not necessarily always going to be the case the magazine would start preparing further powder charges so because obviously you don't normally want to have your powder sitting in cloth bags all the time but if you're preparing for action you are going to need a fair number of those so start preparing them the surgeon on the all up deck would be making ready his tools and getting ready to receive casualties um, various hatches would be being secured or potentially opened depending on what needs to be done because um, some hatches you don't want things coming in and other hatches people need to pass through but might be otherwise closed for weather purposes and so on and so forth if there's anybody in the sick bay aka the cockpit aka the foremost part of the ship above the waterline they would obviously be moved down to the all-op deck so that they don't get hurt marines would go aloft and otherwise be checking and priming all their weapons people would be making sure generally that their own firearms melee weapons etc were ready to go and hammocks uh, mess tables and so forth would also be being stowed or lashed away depending again on the amount of time available andronor asks if the soviet union had allowed the u.s to use its territory to go after japan would a campaign where the u.s navy strikes south from the Sakhalin islands be viable theoretically yes uh, but practically no as some people pointed out in the uh, pacific fleet submarine campaign video the most recent one that i did i made a small error in saying that the la Perouse strait was half under soviet control and half under japanese control and i'd gotten a little bit confused uh, by obviously while i was writing the script looking at what had happened to more mush morton and the fact that having just exited la Perouse, well when he came under attack by the japanese he turned north aiming for a soviet lighthouse so of course my brain had gone of course Sakhalin island Sakhalin lighthouse must be under russian control therefore that's why they must be going through la Perouse. in fact the japanese controlled the southern portion of Sakhalin as they like to pretend with this uh, later globe here so in theory yes it would give the u.s a rather large land base right near the japanese home islands which could be really useful for you know building up troops tanks artillery etc air forces naval units and so forth ready to 
strike Japan from the north. The flip side, of course, is that it would mean that the Allied buildup is taking place on an island that has a land that has a land border with Japan, who would then presumably launch a ground offensive to try and disrupt all of that. So you'd be trying to invade South Sakhalin first, and then only once you'd secured it could you go after the home islands. But at that point, you're right next to the home islands. <laughs> Um, which means that the full attention of the Japanese army and any air for air units they have, uh, plus, of course, some of the Japanese navy, um, is going to be turned on you. So you're going to be trying to essentially build up a remote forward base, because let's face it, Sackland is not really at this point in possession of huge amounts of airstrips infrastructure ports etc itself so you'd be trying to build all of this up whilst the japanese are basically throwing everything and the kitchen sink at you to try and tear it all down um, which at least in the island hopping campaign when the u.s is setting up airstrips on okinawa and so forth you might face the occasional air raid and such but you're not facing any significant concerted efforts from the japanese navy to unseat you or indeed even the Japanese army, once you've dealt with the people who are already there, because there's no real way for the Japanese to get troop transports there to reinforce. So, you know, in principle, it, it's it got a good strategic location, but practically speaking, it would be a massive bloodbath. Patrick Donnelly asks, in addition to Vice Admiral Fletcher, what other officers do you think were unfortunately or prematurely reassigned away from the front? Well, if you want to be completely objective, because bearing in mind him being reassigned to rear echelon areas was a very good thing for the Allies, in my opinion. But if you want to, you know, as I said, go purely by as far as their navy is concerned, in hindsight, it was a mistake to reassign this person away from the front lines. A good candidate would be Admiral Makawa for the Japanese Navy. Now, granted, he didn't have a 100% spotless track record, but he was in command of the first Battle of Savo Island. He had a better idea about what was going on than most Japanese flag officers of the period. And whilst he did, as I said, also command uh, the effort that led to the Battle of Bismarck Sea, he was a very capable and knowledgeable officer, and mostly for just disagreeing with his superiors and not winning hard enough, he was kicked off to rear echelon points. And arguably some Japanese admirals who were less capable were put in in his stead, which obviously for the British and the Americans was great because it meant they could win slightly easier. But for the Japanese, maybe not the smartest move in the world. Another one on the Axis side would be Admiral Marshall, the admiral who led Scharnhorst and Gadeisenau in their attack on HMS Glorious. Now, Obviously, again, having a fairly aggressive, fairly competent German admiral out at sea, as opposed to someone who is persistently trying to run away or second guess their own opinions, would have been bad for the Allies. But objectively speaking, Marshall was a good, competent, capable officer who, by any metric, should have been kept on the front lines to do as much damage to the enemies of his country as humanly possible, and was denied that because he managed to sink a British carrier. And now, admittedly, he did get Sean Hoskins now somewhat damaged in so doing, but they, the Sean Horse were repairable, and uh, Glorious wasn't. To a certain degree, although he was allowed back into frontline action several times, Admiral Tromp of the Dutch Navy would be a good example. Uh, essentially, he was kind of being pulled back from frontline command a few times due to political shenanigans, which, you know, the Royal Navy deeply thanks the Dutch government for doing, because, okay, admittedly, the Dutch did have de Reuter to put in instead, which wasn't really a huge improvement as far as the Royal Navy was concerned, uh, but it was better that the Dutch were internally fighting over whether or not to let one of their most capable admirals actually, you know, go out and admiral on the front lines rather than sending both Trump and de Reuter after the Royal Navy at the same time, which, you know, when they actually got their act together and did so, let's just say most of those battles didn't go too well for the Royal Navy. And finally, for this week, Vinve asks... HMS Victory is 246 years old. Assuming that she gets continued funding, 
can we expect the more complex museum ships from the age of steam and steel to go on for as long, or do they have more of an inbuilt expiration date? In theory, the museum ships from the age of steam and steel should be able to go on for as long or longer. They don't, technically speaking, have a an inbuilt expira expiration date as such, but I sadly have a feeling that they sort of might. Um, what I mean is that for most of them, there's not going to be a point at which they're just going to go, okay, this is completely incapable of being further restored and it's just going to fall apart. But there are some inherent disadvantages to the steam and steel ships compared to Victory. Uh, first of which is history-notoriety. Victory is the flagship of Admiral Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar. You know, if there was ever a thing that said, you must preserve me, that is it. And to be honest, even then, Victory almost wasn't preserved. Whilst a lot of steam and steel ships do have some engagements to their name the number of steam and uh, steel ships that have very notable engagements to their name is considerably lower than the number of actual museum ships that are out there and ships that can lay claim to as story to history as a victory are rarer still and that of course means in terms of the historical preservation side of things whilst preserving any and all of the muse current museum ships is a good and laudable goal. Amongst the general public, the idea of we must preserve this ship, you know, that fought at multiple major battles and was the flagship at Trafalgar, has resonance. We must preserve this ship that did a bunch of random shore bombardments and never actually sank anything or really seriously engaged another surface ship in action has somewhat less resonance to the general public and it's usually the general public that you're asking to cough up the money either directly through donations and visiting the ship or indirectly through a state and national level taxation which is then redirected to the ships and so forth um, another problem with steam and steel ships is that the way they decay because wooden ships assuming that they're still in the water like uh, unicorn or constitution are um the if the wood gets if the sort of the wood protection paint and so forth fails and the wood starts to rot away and get a bit spongy and so forth because they tend to be built in multiple layers as long as your inspection program is fairly up to speed you can look at it and go oh yeah the outer layer of planking is having some issues we'll take that in and replace it and fundamentally, most of the rest of the ship's structure is absolutely fine because, well, planking, rotting away and getting replaced was a thing that happened back in the day when they were in active service as well. Whereas for steam and steel ships, they tend to be, OK, 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 ah, there's a leak. And that's a little bit more dramatic and a little bit harder to fix. And if you do get a leak, obviously a wooden warship, especially a wooden museum ship that has probably had most of its original ordnance replaced with fiberglass replicas, doesn't have hundreds of crew and enough stores for six months at sea and water and has probably had most of its ballast removed, etc., etc., is generally quite buoyant. So it will take a while for a wooden museum ship that has a leak in it to start to appreciably sink, whereas a steel warship or an iron warship is inherently negatively buoyant once the spaces start filling with water which means they tend to go down a lot lot faster which makes it harder to deal with another problem <laughs> yet another one and i think possibly the single largest one for the extreme long-term future of a lot of steam and steel ships is that they're just bigger and with bigger means more expense, more cost to repair. I mean, Victory is having a huge multi-year refit, and yeah, it's expensive. Um, they're not quite tearing her down to the bare, bare planking and doing her back up again, but they are replacing an awful lot of the outer planking. Um, the original frames and decks and stuff are there, but and eventually, obviously, the mast will go back up. 
but you know victory is very much a ship of theseus there is not a huge amount of completely original timber there but then to be fair again with wooden warships there wasn't a particularly huge amount of original timber there when she fought at trafalgar she was already very old and had been through several major refits at that point so um but anyway the, the point i was getting at is that that's expensive but victory is comparatively a relatively small ship one of the uh, more recent little anecdotes that you can relate now that we have the queen elizabeth class carriers in service in the uk is that you could if you picked up victory and put her across the flight deck of a queen elizabeth class carrier the queen elizabeth class at its widest is actually wider than victory is long and that means there is a finite amount of material and volume that you can actually you know preserve and therefore may pay money to preserve on victory whereas big steam and steel ships that are in the five digit ton range you know 10 20 30 40 50 thousand 60 thousand tons there's just so much more of them that the maintenance and running costs of them are higher and when they need to go in for repairs there's so much more ship that needs repair which means more cost which means it's hard to get that money from the various authorities, you know, combined with all the other issues, which means that I think as long as the interest is still there, steam and steel ships can be made to go for as long or longer as, than victory. But the threshold below which interest and funding drops to a point where the ship is no longer sustainable as a museum vessel is that point is probably a higher point and therefore you know easier to fall past than it is for a ship like victory which is unfortunate and as i said it can be circumvented by just maintaining that interest level higher but essentially victory could survive on considerably less interest visitors and therefore revenue than say a battleship a world war ii battleship could and that may be an inbuilt expiration date for some ships but we shall have to see because you know a, a lot of museum ships are only museum ships because they manage to cross that initial hump from being a oh it's just a slightly older ship that's just come out of service why do we care to this is actually a piece of history we want to preserve it and now they have to get past the secondary hump of having passed from this is a historical piece of naval history to this is a historical piece of national history that is part of the fabric of the nation and therefore must be preserved and if you managed to reach this far congratulations um so yeah a little bit short notice but i will be heading out to the u.s uh, as of the time that you're listening to this, if you're listening to it on the day of release in about a week and a half, and there is a schedule, albeit one or two bits are a little bit tentative, and it, obviously everything will be subject to a few updates as well. So at the moment, I'll be heading over to the US on the 15th, but the first opportunity, as I say, at the moment to come and say hi will be on the 20th of February, aboard USS Kidd in Baton Rouge. Then on the 21st of February, I'll be at the Pensacola Naval Aviation Museum with any luck. I have sent them uh, an email or two asking for permission to film there. Haven't heard back from them yet. Um, if anyone who's listening to this knows anyone who works there, maybe give them a poke or something. Um, then on the 22nd of February, I will be at the Mariners Museum in Norfolk. That's where they've got the replica and the preserved bits of USS Monitor. Uh, on the 23rd of February, uh, unless you happen to be a US Navy or officer or cadet, then you won't be able to meet me because I will be uh, at the US Naval Institute. But on the 24th, which is my flight home in the very late evening, but during the day on the 24th, I will be aboard USS New Jersey. Uh, so that will be probably, I, I think... It's going to be one of the one of, if not the last weekends they're open prior to going into dry dock. So, you know, come and have a look there and also keep an eye on USS New Jersey's website because we might be doing one or two special things aboard New Jersey during the day. 
as I said, there will be a community post going up in uh, maybe a few days, uh, up to a week or so from now. And I know that is a little bit short notice, but there obviously are one or two things I need to iron out 100% before I say anything public, um, and especially obviously uh, with the Pensacola Naval Aviation Museum. Hopefully they'll come back to me. And uh, yeah, hope to see some of you out there. Bye for now.